Listening test two, section one. You will hear a conversation between Aneta and Charlotte, first-year university students, and Bill, who works for the Student Union Employment Service. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Notice that an example has been done for you. This time only, the conversation relating to the example will be played first. Hi, Bill. This is my friend Charlotte. She's doing first year science too. The student is in first year science, so you write science on the form. Now let's begin. Answer the questions as you listen. You will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the conversation, and answer questions one to five. Hi, Bill. This is my friend Charlotte. She's doing first year science too. Pleased to meet you, Charlotte. Annetta told me you want some part time work. Now I just have to complete your details on the computer.、Um, what's your surname? Johnston. With an E. Yes, J O H N S T O N E. I know that you live in the Heathfield Street Student Residence, but I can't remember the street number there. It's one twenty six. One two six. Good. And the phone number? Well, actually, I never give people that number because sometimes nobody answers. Or they forget to pass on the messages. So, I bought a mobile phone yesterday, but I can't remember the number. I think it's o four one four eight four seven seven four eight. I'll just check. No, sorry, not seven four eight. It's seven four nine. O four one four. Eight four seven seven four nine. Yes, that's right. I must try and remember it. And what sort of work are you looking for? Well, anything really, I suppose. Though it depends when it is. I'd rather work during the day if that's possible. How many hours a week were you thinking of? Oh, I'm not sure. Maybe about ten. I need to keep at least two days a week free for study. Do you have any work experience? Not much, though. I used to help in my uncle's shop when I was at school. Okay, well, I'll put it in, but we don't usually get shop work. What about gardening? I'd rather not. Everything I touch dies. What other kinds of work are there? Well, there's a a lot of demand for house cleaning, fast food preparation, and kitchen work, and pizza delivery. If you've held a driving license for twelve months, I'm not sure. Can I have a look at the vacancies while you talk to Annetta? You now have some time to look at questions six to eleven. As you listen to the rest of the conversation, answer questions six to eleven. Bill, I'd like to change my job. You're at the Hamburger Express on the High Street, aren't you? What's the problem? Well, I never know what hours I'm going to work. I start at seven p.m. and I'm supposed to finish at eleven p.m., but sometimes they keep me until two or three a.m. Yes, that is a bit late if you have to make a nine a.m. lecture the next day. And the other thing is the pay. They're supposed to pay me on Thursdays. But they never pay me on the correct day. Often not until Friday or Saturday. A few weeks ago, I had to wait until Sunday. They said their son was sick, so they couldn't get to the bank. 
But they're always making excuses. Yes, that doesn't sound too good. Would you be interested in pizza delivery? You need to have a driving licence. Yes, I've got a licence, but I think I'd like to change from working in the evening. Are there any day jobs available? Well, as I told Charlotte, there are several cleaning and gardening vacancies.、Uh, and this childcare job that just came in this morning. Do you like children? Yes, I do actually. What's the job? Let's have a look. Collect the boy aged four from kindergarten at three p.m. Pick up the other two girls who are aged six and nine from the primary school at three fifteen. You take them home and look after them. The parents will be home by seven. That sounds quite good. What about the pay? It's the same as you're earning now: four hours a day, Monday to Friday, so twenty hours a week. You need to contact Mrs.、Uh, Alicia Thompson. Her phone number is nine one zero four five six two nine, and she lives in Springfield. I've never been to Springfield. I hope I don't get lost. Don't worry. It sounds quite straightforward. Let's have a look at the street directory. The Thompsons live here in Tulip Street, number two fifty two. So you catch the six three one bus, get off here next to the post office in Daisy Terrace, walk past the post office to the corner, and on the opposite corner is the kindergarten. Then. Walk down Daffodil Place and cross over to the primary school. Then, keep going down Daffodil Place to the corner and turn right into Tulip Street. That is the end of section one. You have half a minute to check your answers. Listening, section two. You will hear a talk about young people living on their own. Listen carefully and answer questions eleven to twelve. Loneliness is something we all suffer from in varying degrees, but young people living on their own can be particularly vulnerable. Many who leave the family home find they are less confident and have more difficulty in finding their feet than they expected. Often, going to work or study in another town or city will be the first time they have lived away from home. Although this may sound like an adventure for those dying to get away from the glare of the parental eye, for others it is a daunting prospect which generates apprehension, uncertainty, and even fear. In fact, in a recent survey of over sixteen hundred people who had recently left home, thirty-two percent said that understanding and coping with loneliness was a crucial issue for them, and made them feel highly stressed and distracted. An annual report by researchers last year recorded a noticeable increase in the number of individuals with homesickness, transition, and isolation issues. Acknowledging that feelings of loneliness and isolation could impede progress at work or study, they examined the number of people using the welfare and health services. They found that young people, in particular, were prone to difficulties. Last year, 61 percent of all people using counselling services were aged under 30, and of this group, 57 percent were men. Test two, listening, section two. Now listen and answer questions thirteen to twenty. Leaving home involves a major change in lifestyle, work patterns, and degree of independence. You will be away from home, family, and friends, and are no longer supported by familiar surroundings. For this reason, in the first year, a lot of young people suffer from loneliness. Ironically, this sense of isolation comes at a time when you are likely to be surrounded by people most of the time. Living in a busy city, travelling on crowded buses and trains, 
you will be constantly among people, but this can sometimes compound your sense of being alone. Seeing others who appear at ease among large crowds, mingling and making friends, can make you feel excluded and inadequate. Adapting to a new environment makes people uncertain of what to do or how to behave, and breeds insecurities which can make for a real sense of isolation. It is often those who are more used to being on their own who deal best with the transitional period of leaving home. Other reasons for feeling alone include high expectations of the big city, where you have the best time of your life and meet lifelong friends. It may be the first time you have had to make new friends since you started primary school, and perhaps you are reluctant or finding it hard to replace old friends whom you miss. There are also pressures to juggle work and socialising, which may leave you feeling left out. Or it could be that you have a long-distance relationship and feel torn between your new lifestyle and that special person who lives so far away. Because loneliness can leave you with a sense of low self-esteem, where you become self-conscious and feel you have been rejected, it is very difficult to overcome. You may be reluctant to even try and make new friends or take part in social activities, and will also find it difficult to say no to things, leaving you feeling exploited and weak. One of the ways of combating loneliness is to remember that it's not your fault, and that it's something everyone has to deal with, despite appearances. Counselors advise those feeling lonely to speak to someone they know about their feelings. They also ask them to consider joining groups and societies, and to get involved in activities which interest them, as a way of meeting more people. Of course, overdoing it and jamming your schedule with too many things just to avoid being alone will not work. But meeting others with common interests may be a step forward. If you still feel like you need someone to talk to, you could try group counselling. Where you will be able to talk to and receive support from a small number of people with the same difficulties as you. For more information or to be put in touch with an individual counsellor, contact the local town hall support services. That is the end of section two. Test two, listening, section three. You will hear somebody talking to a group of students about a university language centre. Listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Hi, I'm Katie Shaw, and I work at the university language centre. Your tutor tells me you might be interested in using the centre, so I'm here at the college to explain a bit about it and, of course, to answer your questions. Where exactly is the centre? Is it near the college? It's actually on Kings Road, just round the corner from here. In fact. Oh, I know it. Yes, I wondered what that building was. Yes, what's there? Well, the library has about four thousand books, pamphlets, and transcripts to go with some of the twelve thousand five hundred items on audio or video cassettes. These are at a wide range of levels of difficulty, covering language learning material in over one hundred languages. There are also reference books without tapes, including dictionaries, grammars, grammar workbooks, vocabulary workbooks, and model letters, as well as texts on academic writing and effective study habits, etc. Audio cassette workrooms are on the first floor, by the way. Do they get any foreign language press there too? Yes, the library subscribes to a number of European daily and weekly newspapers, including Le Monde from France. Lespresso from Italy, and the weekly international edition of the Spanish paper El País. What about learning with computers? Can you do that there? Call or computer-aided language learning is available on the first floor. Um, how many PCs are there? Counting both Macintosh and PC platforms, there are nine at present. There are materials in over fifteen different languages, and new material and language categories are being added as library funds permit. The programs cover verb drills,、uh, grammar exercises, activities to accompany multimedia textbooks, pronunciation, translation, and some multimedia applications. 
The same hardware permits access to the internet with its many language learning and discussion sites. What about TV? That's a good way of learning a language too. Yes, definitely. We agree. So on the second floor of the centre, there are televisions to view live satellite television broadcasts in seven languages. Oh, which ones are they? Currently, we've got Arabic, French, German, Italian, Portuguese, Spanish and Russian. Turkish broadcasting can be viewed live on request. The centre records the news in French, German, Arabic, Italian, Japanese, Spanish and Russian. And English too. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Test 2. Listening. Section 3. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. Sounds great. How do we sign up? To avoid paying a fee, you need to go to the centre with a valid university ID card or a letter from your college or departmental administrator on headed paper indicating your status, length of stay and language requirements. Are there any forms to fill in? I'm afraid so. <laughs> you do that at the ground floor reception desk. Your registration is for one academic year only and needs to be renewed annually. You should tell the librarian who you are on your first visit and you will need to take part in an induction to the library service, including the proper operation of the centre's computers, televisions, videos and so on. Can she help us choose the right materials too? Yes. The librarian can give advice and assistance in locating material, making best use of the texts and tapes and so on. Let her know which language you want to study and what, if any, knowledge of it you already have. Also, say what reasons you have for learning the language. Your answers will help the librarian help you make the best choice of books and tapes for your needs. She can also offer you advice on how much time is needed to make progress in the language and can offer suggestions on how to improve your language learning techniques. Can she copy tapes for us to take home or can we borrow them? The library is a resource centre and reference library only. You can do as much self-study listening and reading work there as you want. But it's not possible to take home materials, that's to say, books or cassettes. And copyright law doesn't permit the library or its staff to make copies of cassettes for use by students outside the centre. All material must be used on the premises, I'm afraid. This ensures the materials are always available for students working on their own and not out on loan for long periods, which could harm users' progress. So, if we can't take books home... Is it OK to photocopy them? The library staff will handle any photocopying, though international copyright law prohibits users from copying more than 5% of any one title in the academic year. You place a photocopy order with the librarian or an assistant and orders will be processed between 1 and 2 o'clock or after 5.30. How much does it cost? 10 pence per page. Payment is by photocopy card which you can buy from the information desk on the ground floor. That is the end of Section 3. Section 4. You will hear part of a talk about the design of the zip fastener. Listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 34. I think you all have a copy of the printed notes and diagram, but I should point out before we go any further that there are a few mistakes in those notes, so please correct any you notice as we go along. Right. As you can see, we are going to be looking at the zip, or zipper, as it's known in the U.S., which is where it had its origins in 1851. In fact, it was initially given the rather less catchy name of the Automatic Continuous Clothing Closure by the person that invented it, Elias Howe, who also designed the first sewing machine. It wasn't until 1893, though, that someone actually tried to market the zip, 
when Whitcomb Judson, another American inventor, took what he called the clasp locker to the World's Fair held that year in the U.S. His hook and eye system was a commercial disaster, and it was another 15 years before the buying public began to take an interest. This time, a more reliable model with facing sets of teeth named the hookless fastener, designed by a Swedish engineer called Gideon Sundback. Attached to clothing, purses, and other items, it sold quite well. Gradually, this new alternative to buttons caught on. As people realized the advantages of a fastener that only needed one hand to operate, that children could use, that left no visible gaps, and so on, the British firm Kinnock began producing and selling the Ready Fastener in large numbers in 1919. And a few years later, the zipper, designed and given its modern American name by B.F. Goodrich, made Mr. Goodrich extremely rich indeed. Test 2. Listening. Section 4. Now listen and answer questions 35 to 40. If its use in trousers was a major factor in establishing the zip as a fashion icon, despite its occasional tendency to trap parts of the wearer's anatomy, another major breakthrough came with the separable zip, the kind that opens at both ends. This type, still widely used in a range of items, from jackets to tents, is shown in the diagram. Let's look first at the right-hand side of the illustration, at the material attached to the uh, item of clothing, the bag, or whatever. This is the tape, which is usually made of fairly tough fabric. At the end of that, there's what is known as the heat seal patch, the cotton and nylon laminated material used to reinforce the tape. Now, alongside the heat seal patch is a small piece of metal used only on a separating zip, whose function is to enable the two halves of the zip to join. This is known as the pin. Opposite that, on the other half of the zip in the diagram, is a device which correctly aligns the pin. The box, as it's called, begins the joining of the zip halves. Running up the inside edge of each half are dozens, possibly hundreds, of metal teeth, each of which has a small hook and an equally tiny hollow. Moving up and down the teeth to open and close the zip is a piece of metal called the slider. This is operated by means of a pull tab, so-called because, logically enough, the wearer or a user pulls it in one direction or the other. To close the zip, a wedge inside the slider pushes the hook of each tooth on one side into the hollow of each offset tooth on the other. To open it, the wedge forces them apart. To prevent the slider coming off the teeth at the other end, there is a top stop on both sides of the zip. This basic design has changed little in the many years since it was first introduced, although nowadays, of course, zips, uh, zippers, are available in a whole range of shapes, sizes, and materials. That is the end of Test 2.